We've lost the mystery, we've lost the magic, and we've forgotten Pachamama. After two to three hundred years of industrialization uh, and, and technology, is that somehow uh, in the process of creating the illusion of, of physical and material safety, uh, we've, we've created a kind of monstrous uh, society which has uh, almost completely severed its connections to the spiritual roots of all being. And when you look at our society and you say, well, you know, we're at the brinks of destruction, you know, the biological structures, you know, our environment is falling apart, our society, even our, our financial structure is falling apart, everything is falling apart. There's no point in being pessimist and say, oh, what can we do? Everything is going bad, everything is going bad. Everything is not going bad. These things are dying. Mm. The old system is dying. So do not worry, do not moan about it. Celebrate the death of the old system. Mm. If it's collapsing, let it collapse. Mm. If it is dying, let it die. <laughs> Our job is to be midwife of the new system. Now, I realize that in working for the outer peace, uh, the most valid way to work is on the inner peace, because every human being who finds inner peace, of course, uh, will bring the world that much closer to the outer peace. What, I, what I've discovered as, I, as I've gone along um, is that there is a, that there's an inward journey that we that we need to pursue which is which is part of the pilgrimage process let us never stay hopelessly this is the darkness before a storm let us rather say with faith this is the darkness before the dawn of a golden age of peace which we cannot now even imagine for this let us hope and work and pray There are still people all over the world who inherently understand how we humans should be in relationship to our environment and who have kept alive an attitude of gratitude toward Earth and its entire living library. No, pero los primeros humanos, los primeros andinos, valoran como ahora seguimos respetando, conservando la naturaleza han, igual, igualmente se dice que los primeros oh, hombres andinos, inclusive algunos que vivían en la selva, tenían gratitud a la Pachamama. La Pachamama no es tanto así un dios, no es una persona, es todo, es el complemento armónico que existe en el cosmos. ¿no? El sol es parte, la luna es parte, es un padre, es una mamá, ¿no? por eso hay que es intitaita, mamaquilla, Hay las estrellas que son hermanos, los cerros, los apus, que son protectores. Los lagos igual eh, son abuelos, son abuelas que, que nos oh, dan la vida, nos apoyan la vida. On the other side of the planet, Rumi knew this because he was passionately connected to the heart. He reminds us constantly that it is there we must look for answers. What is the heart? It is not human, and it is not imaginary. I call it you. St
stately bird who one moment combines with this world and the next passes through the boundary to the unseen. The soul cannot find you because you are the soul's wings. How it moves, eyes cannot see you. You are the source of light. You are the one thing repentance will not repent, nor news report. Spring comes. One seed refuses to germinate and start being a tree. One poor piece of wood blackens but will not catch fire. The alchemist wonders at a bit of copper that resists turning to gold. Who am I that I am with you and still myself? When the sun comes up, the complicated night mind of the constellations fades. Snow forms do not last through July. The heart quality embodied by our master Shams Tabriz will always dissolve the old quarrels between those who believe in the dignity of a human being's decisions and those who claim those are all illusion. If you go back to, for example, the ancient Egyptian religious tradition, their whole concern really was with preparation for the afterlife. That's right. Um, and and uh, the, 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 this involved uh, intense uh, spiritual journeys, which had to which had to be made so that one could have experiences that would actually prepare you for the mysterious realms that lie that lie beyond uh, life. And that's where uh, ancient Egypt is gone. We may refer to its books, we may refer to its uh, literature, uh, but the living experience of exploration of other realms, who can we turn to in our world today? Only to the shamans, right. who, who do that as part of their daily bread. That is part of their everyday life, is the exploration of, of other realms. And, and I often feel that we in the, in the West, in the industrialized, the technological countries, are really children Mm. by comparison with the shamans. We're taught to believe that our cultures are so superior because of their technology, uh, but incredibly inferior, in my view, uh, in terms of spiritual exploration. And, and if we really want to, to be pilgrims in the truest of senses, then we need to listen to what the shamans have to teach us. Well, 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 medicine. Well, well, medicine. Well, well, mariposa. Well, well, mariposa. This tradition of the use of this cactus been going on five, six thousand years. A very old tradition. My understanding of where I've interacted with these people and asked them about their medicine, they feel that our state of well-being, if it becomes out of balance, if the material and the spiritual realm become out of balance, we're too preoccupied with the, the relative field, it throws the body out of balance and it's going to result in sickness in whatever fashion it mm. comes. So if you go into the jungle and say, I, I, I need healing or I need clen cleansing, they're, they're going to give you something that's going to make you throw up or that's going to make you shit. They're mm. going to clean you first. Mm. And maybe that is sufficient to bring these two elements of, of, of man into balance. And you go down to those shamans and you start talking about these as being drugs and you're going to hear, you're going to get a mouthful from mm. these boys. Mm. It's mm. like this is some kind of mental conditioning from your world. Mm. But this is a plant of this world, mm. of the new world. And this is a sacred medicine. It's to be treated as such. It's to be regarded as such. And so as we're preparing the medicine and putting it in the pot and boiling it up for hours, it's important that we put our own good intentions for, for good and responsible use of this. Because we are the the current day uh, tenants or adherents or making use of this, this tradition, let us honour it fully.
As Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. And in wishing for a more balanced, harmonious state of humanity, it is essential to seek that state within yourself first. For the people of this land, shamanic plant use had fulfilled this purpose for millennia. And so the choice was made to go through a shamanic journey to attain such balance before climbing to the next step of the grander pilgrimage. And like any journey, any, even a physical journey mm. in this world, we must prepare ourselves for it well. And we must seek the advice uh, of those who've perhaps trodden that path before. Absolutely. Because they will have something to tell us, and it would be very arrogant and stupid of us not to listen to what they've had to say. But that done, and all the preparations made, we should make the journey. I believe we should make the journey. This is part of, part of what we've been offered, the giant potential that we've been offered as human beings. We shouldn't turn our backs on it, no matter the risks or the dangers. In a deserted pre-Columbian sanctuary, in the sacred valley of the Incas, pilgrims would do ceremony using the revered cactus Washuma to maintain their balance and connection with Pachamama. This prepares one for the challenges of the Koyuriti pilgrimage. En esta fecha de la visita, que para muchos también lo llaman peregrinación a Koyuriti, es no más una forma de honrar, de agradecer a la vida, a la naturaleza, porque justamente ahí hay un elemento de sustento que nos da la vida a toda la humanidad y a todos los seres, pienso, en el, en el planeta, que es el agua. Eh, cuando uno quiere buscar su etimología, como dicen siempre, es a koyur riti, dos palabras que hechos. Koyur mayormente se denomina a una estrella muy fuerte, con luz muy fuerte, pero también quiere decir perpetuo, ¿no? Entonces, y, 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 riti, es nevado, nieve. Entonces, y Apu es la nominación que se le da de respeto a una montaña, se le hace sagrado. Apu Koyoriti, montaña de luz o montaña perpetua y sagrada. Entonces, ahí es donde van todos desde hace mucho tiempo ¿no? a, a honrar a nuestros ancestros. A, a la vida, al, al agua, un agradecimiento a un elemento tan importante que en estos tiempos está desapareciendo. Aquí en la sociedad, en el mundo andino, existió un orden de vida, un agradecimiento, un balance muy bonito llamado Aini. Aini. ¿No? El Aini es eh, saber ayudarnos, saber compartir, ¿no? Eh, brindar tu vida, sacrificar tu vida uno y otro. Y eso es, por ejemplo, lo que hace el agua. Su propia existencia está matándose incluso, ¿no? por mucha gente que no es consciente que, la, que eh, la naturaleza es tan sagrada. La Pachamama es tan importante para la vida. Los llamados también como recursos naturales para los que eh, piensan en la industrialización, en el desarrollo, pero no la respetan. ¿No? La, están extrayendo, están destruyendo, están, uh, hay un descontrol, una desmedida explotación. Entonces nosotros, él está, es como decir, el Apu, la Pachamama está sufriendo, está siendo destruido. Y, y siento yo cuando voy, ir a, y decirle, no, yo estoy, yo te ayudo en tu dolor. ¿Por qué? Porque yo sí te reconozco que tú das a la humanidad mucho con tu agua con tu protección, con tu vida, con tu luz, con tu transparencia, ¿no? Y entonces, esa es la forma del Aini para nosotros. You know, the, Southern Peru is a, exemplifies this, you know, that they're, 
the notion that the earth is animate and alive is, is not a metaphor. People literally believe that the earth is alive, responsive to the human aspiration, even as a human destiny is wrapped up in a reciprocal relationship that implies obligations to the earth itself. So that every community in the Andes is dominated by a sacred mountain known as an Apu. And as long as you're in the shadow of that Apu, it will direct in some way your destiny. Now this is not that esoteric a notion in the landscape in which the mountains quite literally create the weather in an agricultural civilization and set of communities in which hail can wipe out a crop in 15 minutes. Apu Koyariti is the sacred mountain spirit living high up at 16,000 feet where people go to give thanks to him and to the water he provides as part of the reciprocal exchange system these people have with the planet. The key to any pilgrimage in whatever shape or form, you don't have to be on a mountain, you don't have to be in Peru, you could be walking to your workplace, going to your dance hall. I mean, once you understand what the pilgrim encompasses, and you understand that we can only ever take one step at a time. You can't take two or three. And by only taking one step, at a time, doesn't matter how tired you are, doesn't matter how depressed you are, doesn't matter how whatever you are. If you can just do the one, you can do the other. And if you can do the other, you can do the next one. And I don't know how high we are now, but the, uh, yeah, it's getting pretty thin. Feels beautiful though. Feels beautiful to put one step ahead of another here. Each year, 60,000 pilgrims gather here in the sacred valley of the Sinacara, cradled by the three tongues of the great glacier. In a fantastic fusion of Christian and pre-Columbian ideas, these pilgrims from every part of Peru come bearing the hopes and wishes of their villages to celebrate and give thanks on their behalf. It's 6.35, morning of the 20th of May, and this is the penultimate moment is approaching when the rays of the sun, the first rays of the sun will strike the cross up on the ice field where we're about to walk. So let's go. Since the infusion of Christian ideas brought by the Spanish, this festival has adopted the syncretic worship of Jesus alongside praise of the mountain deity and the vital sustaining element, water. But throughout its history, Nothing has changed the basic core attitude of reverence and respect for nature and the unseen world. So we have this amazing dynamic going on here. We have thousands and thousands of people, the majority of who consider themselves to be Christian pilgrims. We have, we have photographs of the Lord, we have paintings of the Lord. We have all things Christian 
and yet we are in this entirely alien to the Christian environment environment so it really is uh, an amazing blend of cultures of belief systems but one thing is for sure you have to believe something to get yourself up here and spend the night in this kind of weather you got to believe that it's important relying on only the most basic necessities these simple, hardy people embrace the severe conditions of high altitude, many of whom wear only sandals made of tires. They transmute themselves through this challenging situation to complete the central metaphor of going into the mountain as an individual, but through suffering and through sacrifice, emerging as a community that has once again reaffirmed its sense of place on the planet. These are real tough earth pilgrims, that's for sure. We saw a woman this morning outside our tent and uh, she had nothing but a plastic sheet over her uh, all night in minus, must have been about minus 10 last night. Hundreds and hundreds of these people are just sleeping out. Tremendously tough, resilient people. Todos cuando hace frío no, no se protegen. Normal se ponen a bailar. El mismo caminar. Estás respirando la vida, estás a ese movimiento de la dinámica. Es una relación muy distinta, por eso no es simplemente por eso de una fiesta, es una conexión, es una conversación, ese sentir, esa, esa misma fuerza de vida, de energía. The concept of our journey, the, the Earth Pilgrim's journey is closely related to the idea that our entire planet, Earth, seems to be preparing to go through her own, perhaps dark night, her own shivering night, her night of hyperventilation. I see, I feel many changes coming to our planet, but when I see these people here who can survive on so little with so much power and so much dignity and so much peace there is no feeling here everybody's going through difficulties not just me people who've taken their families up here babies who may be sick people who don't have enough to eat have come up here against all odds to celebrate to celebrate life to celebrate this beautiful planet this incredible astonishing place and maybe in later years when more of us have to face difficulties we'll remember that joy is always possible beauty is always possible and peace is always there if we can just allow ourselves to move into that state of mind which I call the pilgrim if we can all get a little hint of that from these fantastic people just a hint it may help us all in the days ahead The whole body resonates, the whole body resonates, the whole mountain resonates. I can feel it in every cell.
That was the most astonishing gathering of human energy, power, beauty, color, celebration, all a spectacular revelation of human creativity and joy. I don't know what you can say about this. What we experienced with what Schumann was was something incredible, but here it was produced by the energy of the human heart. That's where it gets you. Right here. The fact that close to 60,000 people still choose to honor God and the earth in this way suggests that a walk your talk gratitude is not a question of economics or politics, but more a change of heart. If you really believed that receiving sustenance depended on expressing thanks to the environment, then perhaps you would dance and sing almost until your last breath knowing that your pilgrimage had meaning and power and made a difference. Coyoriti, desde hace dos años, tres años, está en la visión, no me recuerdo de qué corporación minera que quiere explotar. Y hay un proyecto, es destruir toda la montaña porque hay mucho mineral ahí. The thing that I notice so often is that um, indigenous people, when they become aware um, of these changes, they feel a personal responsibility. And this is one of the great tragedies. I mean, for example, you know, when people in the Himalaya or in the Andes um, who believe the earth is alive, believe in mountain deities, if things go uh, askew, they take it very personally. I mean, one of the most um, kind of poignant examples of that is what you experienced the Koyariti. I mean, traditionally, of course, the Koyariti is this syncretic fusion of pre-Columbian and Catholic ideas a perfect expression of this pan-Indian world, which, um, you know, is as, as influenced by Catholicism as, by, as it is by pre-Columbian and Caic and pre incaic ideas. But pilgrimage becomes a sacred movement to the ice, so that this wonderful metaphor of taking the crosses from your community, placing them into the, into the, uh, the, the tongues of the glacier that comes down over the Sinicata Valley, leaving them overnight to empower them that you can take it back to your community. But but remember as well that traditionally you also brought chunks of ice back to your community. And they've stopped doing that because they're witnessing the recession of the glaciers. And they take it as their own personal responsibility and fault. And that's very moving because of course the trivial amount of ice that was chipped from those glaciers and brought home as the essence of Pachamama to those who couldn't participate in the pilgrimage is trivial compared to what of course is really happening is this is recession of the glaciers. From the old world to the new, environmental degradation is coming at us all like a wave. And it now seems that this ancient festival will soon run out of the sacred ice it is based on. It seems that no amount of true pilgrimage energy can even touch what we are all up against. G 
genocide, the physical extermination of a people is universally condemned, but ethnocide, which in a sense is the destruction either directly or indirectly of a people's way of life, is not only not condemned in many circles, it's still promoted as yeah. development um, policy, you know. And again, you know, none of us in anthropology would be suggesting, you know, freezing people in time, you know, like some kind of uh, biological specimen making zoological parks of the imagination. Shit. You know, there, there, there's, there's this, there, you know, change is no threat to culture. You know, all cultures have always been dancing with new possibilities for yeah. life. And, and technology is no threat to culture. I mean, the internet, in fact, is a tremendously liberating yeah. tool. It's become the kind of global campfire for empowerment. And, and I always say, you know, that you know, uh, Lakota Sioux didn't stop being Sioux when they gave up the bow and arrow in favor of the rifle any more than American or Canadian farmers stopped being Canadian or American when they gave up the horse and buggy in favor of the automobile. It, it's so important that you know we have this idea that these cultures are delicate or fragile, destined to fade away, and it's simply not true. Mm -hmm. They're not threatened by change. They're not threatened by technology. They're threatened by power. In every case, these are dynamic, living, independent peoples um, who are being driven out of existence by identifiable forces. And that, as I've written, is actually an optimistic observation because it suggests if human beings are the agents of cultural destruction, we can be the facilitators of cultural survival. Mm -hmm. You know, if this process is, is, you know, somehow coming out of the natural world, there's nothing we can do about it. But that's not the case. And so we have choices. And the choices isn't to freeze people in time, it's to ask ourselves what kind of world do we want to live in? How do we create a truly multicultural, pluralistic world um, in which you know, we can benefit from the collective uh, experience and knowledge of all peoples? When a species literally begins to decimate the very essence of its survival options, then surely this must give us pause to consider the profound severity of our collective situation. Since we continue to do this apparently without compunction, it suggests either species-wide madness or something entirely different, something we may not have seen coming. This groggy time we live, this is what it is like. A man goes to sleep in the town where he has always lived, and he dreams he is living in another town. In the dream, he does not remember the town he is sleeping in his bed in. He believes the reality of the dream town. This world is that kind of sleep. The dust of many crumbled cities settles over us like a forgetful doze, but we are older than those cities. We began as a mineral. We emerged into plant life and into the animal state, then into being human, and always we have forgotten our former states, except in early spring when we almost remember being green again. Humankind is being led along an evolving course through this migration of intelligences. And though we seem to be sleeping, there is an inner wakefulness that directs the dream. It will eventually startle us back to the truth of who we are.